afternoon. Is this mic working? Good. Good afternoon. Hope, hope everybody's had a good conference. I, uh, I plagued Patrick to give me the last slot again because it was kind of lucky charm from last year. And I've got to say that it's amazing to see so many people here and so many people that have travelled from from different places around, particularly at you know one of the most important times in, in world history. And I'm, I'm glad that so many people from other countries have come to celebrate England's victory in the World Cup. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about some stuff. So, here we go. Rock and roll. I want to talk about the fine art of web design. And... Uh, I don't know whether anybody knows, but I started off, I wasn't a web designer, and contrary to popular belief, I wasn't Andy Budd's sidekick to begin with. <laughs> I started off by going to art school, and uh, interestingly, after kind of coming up, has anybody here done, been to actual art school, graphic design school, a few people? It was a real change, because I'd been used to... Um, I'd been used to school and, and all the things that you have to do, you know, you have to kind of conform, and I remember you know, A-level art, having to paint a watercolour in, like, two hours or something. And the, the first thing that happened when, uh, when I got to art school, which is up, up in Nottingham, was uh, we spent a week just playing games, and it was amazing. And uh, really the idea was that we should just try to forget about the stuff that we'd learn and to think about, you know, what was out there and what was new. And one of the first games that we played... Um, was the, the, the lecturer at college said, um, you know, we'd, we'd like you to, you know, to get up and, and, and stand on, on, your on, the on your chair and on the table. Um, so is, is Cameron Adams in the room? Cameron, can you stand up on your chair for me, please? <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. A big hand for Cameron Adams standing up. It's interesting that just doing something as simple as, as standing on your chair gives you a totally different perspective of the room because sat down there on the chairs, you, you're, you're seeing things from a particular viewpoint, you're seeing them from a particular angle, and being up there, I think, Cameron, gives you a, gives you a, a different view of, of, of the open space of the room. Thank you when you're short, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is, it's actually a bit of a shame for Cameron, so I think everybody should keep him company just up there for a moment. So get on your chairs, come on. Let's, uh, <laughs> This is going to freak the organisers out. <laughs> OK, that's great. OK, take a seat. That was, that was great. Thank you very much. Really, the interesting thing, I think, it, when we're talking about design of all kinds, but particularly now design for the web, because it is such a, a dynamic medium, is that we need to start thinking about things in different ways. And that's the kind of thing that I want to talk about this afternoon. So, according to my... Uh, blurb. The first thing that I want to do is uh, I just want to want to do things in kind of reverse order and, and, and get a little bit of housekeeping out of the way at the beginning. Um, I don't know whether some of you that uh, uh, know me or are familiar, but I've had a difficult time this uh, this last year professionally and, and personally, and uh, I don't think that I could have, have been stood here today if it wasn't for the support of my friends and, and people that read my blog and stuff. And I wanted to say a very big thank you. This list isn't complete obviously but all of these people have been great friends and great inspiration and uh, and I'm very pleased and, and grateful for everybody for turning up as well so on with the uh, on with the show this is the kind of thing that we're going to talk about this afternoon I want to really do what we, we're doing by standing on chairs really which is, is to challenge the ways that we that we look at what it is that we do looking around seeing different things challenging the way that we perceive things and maybe trying to unlearn some of the things that we've, we've learned in the past. I want to look at the world around and see whether or not there are interesting things that we can bring in from a design point of view, professionally. Look at markup a little bit. It's not going to be a presentation without markup, but hopefully we can make it as fun as possible. And then talk about CSS and where we're going in the future. So, according to my little blurb here, it says on the, in the programme, there we go, Andy Clark, where are we? we go. 
He sees web pages everywhere, leaping out from the pages of magazines, newspapers, record covers, political posters. It might just mean that Andy needs to remember to take his medication. Well, there's, there's some truth in that. Um, actually, I, I don't know whether it's just about seeing web pages everywhere I go, um, but I think I'm seeing my friends <laughs> everywhere I go now. And this was actually taken in, uh, I think this was on Wednesday or something in Carnaby Street. So uh, I am completely going mad, so you'll, you'll forgive me, hopefully, at the end. So, let's talk about the fine art of web design. Well, one of the things that was interesting to me when talking to, uh, to different designers, and I love coming to events like this, is getting different perspectives. And I remember in San Francisco um, last September, I think it was, having a, a conversation with Jeffrey Vino. I don't think Jeffrey's here. Um, but in between Margaritas, he said something, um, Manhattans. In between Manhattans, he said something very, uh, very profound, which I wrote down on the back of a fag packet. And uh, art is design without compromise, was Jeffrey's definition of design. <coughs> and I thought, that's interesting. Because really, the word compromise isn't something that we like to think of in terms of design, is it? It's, we're always tr kind of try trying to come up with new stuff. And I got to thinking a little bit more about this and what it is that we, we're doing when we're designing for the web. And I realized that actually what we're doing is we're struggling a lot of the time. Uh, you know, we're struggling against the materials that we have to work with, um, against the environment that we have to work in. And I don't mean by that whether or not the air conditioning's working. Uh, by the medium, um, and I don't mean by that people who hear voices, like me, who should take their medication. Um, but also, quite often, we're struggling against ourselves as well. And we're struggling against our own preconceptions of what it is that we should be doing. Um, and we're moulded, I think, a little bit by the medium that we work in. And I think it's about time that we really took stock um, and had a, a good look at where we are and what we're doing. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do, you know, we're trying to design products. Um, they happen to be you know, web-based products, but we're trying, to, we're trying to design products which people love to use. And I think sometimes when, we, when, we, when we're talking about the web, we forget about the fact that it is about the love. It is about people engaging with something. It is about the emotional reaction that can come through design. And it's not necessarily just about Ajax or CSS or or semantic markup. So just to look at some of those terms in a little bit more detail. In terms of the environment, um, you know, whether or not it is that we're working on a big 23-inch cinema screen or whether we're designing, um, as Cameron was discussing, on, for, for small mobile spaces, really what we're doing is we're, you know, we're working within a, within a screen space which is, is finite for the most part. And that can be a limitation, particularly when you know, we want to be extending the boundaries all the time as designers. We're also struggling against the, the limitations of the tools that we've got available, um, the materials that we have, um, how fragile they are. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, the web is, is a little bit like kind of making a, a nice sculpture. You, know, you make one small mistake with a hammer, and the whole thing can just shatter. So there is a tremendous flex. Uh, a tremendous um, fragility um, in the tools that we work in. And of course, then we've got the problems with the medium as well. We've got poor support in, in, in older browsers, which again is this limitation that restrains us perhaps from doing the things that we really want to do. But I think the most important limitation and the most important box that we're bound by um, and something that we really have to work on is the limitations that we ourselves have in terms of what our own capabilities are. Uh, in terms of what it is that we're able to do. And also to try to think about, hello, the application Magnolia Blossom. Oh, that's my dashboard widget. I do apologize. We're back on, yeah. We need to unlearn some of the things that we've learned in the past. So what I want to do is I want to take a little bit of a step back and uh, echo some of the things that Eric was talking about during his keynote. Does anybody remember this? 
Isn't it amazing to think that this is kind of where it all started when we started talking about CSS layouts? Um, the Noodle incident and his box left. This was, I think, one of the sites that... Is there anybody in the room that hasn't been to this site at some point in their career just to try to figure out how this stuff's done? The gentleman over there. That's fine. We'll get you a signed copy. <coughs> what about this? Blue Robots Layout Reservoir. Now, there's an extra bonus point in today's quiz for anybody that can tell me the name of the blue robot. Is anybody here, apart from Molly, who knows everything, <laughs> that knows the name of the guy that did this? Molly, who was it? Rob Chandonet. It was Rob Chandonet. Where the hell is Rob Chandonet? These were our starting points in terms of doing what we're doing. Um, and I think that they were not so much inspirational in terms of their design, but for showing us that there were better ways and different ways of doing things. They were also interesting from a historical point of view, in that both of those uh, different sites um, were talking about, were using absolute positioning for the majority of their layouts. And uh, I personally believe that you know, absolute positioning is it's back. It's the new DOM scripting. <laughs> Now, if we move a step forward, we get to something like this. This is the Web Standards Awards. And this was started by Mr. Cameron Adams, again, um, and Andy Budd, and, and Johannes, of course. And I, I was fortunate enough to be a, a judge for a while on this. And along with all of the, the other um, sites that came around of a, of, a, of a similar kind of ilk, this was an interesting one because it was, it was you know, by designers, for designers, rather than a CSS catalogue. And one of the interesting things that's happened over recent, recent weeks, in fact, I think, is that the Web Standards Awards closed its doors. Not because it had been sold for $20,000, but because everybody involved, some of the people involved, felt that it had actually run its course. And there really wasn't that much more to say about CSS. In fact, there's a very... Interesting quote here from, oh my God, Cameron Adams. We've arrived at a situation where beautiful sites with beautiful code are being produced by the hundreds every month, every week, every day. It's no longer a myth that you can produce a stunning site with web standards. Well, Cameron's absolutely right, but he's also wrong. Because what I read from that is that there's not anything really left to talk about that it's kind of become the norm, that we've reached a point with the technologies and with our understandings of them to, we can't do anything more. And I actually don't agree. But we can look back on some of these sites. This was the very first monthly award winner in February 2003. Oh my God. And we've had some great stuff since then. We've had some really inspirational layouts, which you still see cropping up again and again. We start to see echoes of some of this stuff. Does anyone remember Heads of State? Cameron. Did you work on that? That's Jason. That was Jason, wasn't it? And, um, and then, you know, right the way across the world, it wasn't a US or a UK-centric thing. We had WebBurza, which I think is absolutely wonderful. So different styles, different applications, different audiences, um, right the way up to things like a list apart, which were all featured on the Web Standards Awards. So is it a closed book, is my question. Have we really come as far as we can with the technologies that we work with, with markup and CSS? And I wonder why, if that is in fact the case. So what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about the fundamentals of design um, and about some of the rules that have been developed, not just on the web, but over centuries, really, in terms of our understanding of, of how we design. So the first thing that I want to do is to pull up a quotation, which amazingly is not from Cameron Adams, but is from my good friend Mark Bolton, um, who's made a career out of talking about grids. What a great job. What do you do for a living? I talk about grids, in amongst other things. And 
Mark's absolutely right, because understanding the fundamentals of design is extremely important. And understanding, for in this particular instance, the principles of, of designing with grids is important not only so that we can work within them to create pleasing layouts, but so that we can bend and we can break those rules when we want to, because we know how. So, I think everybody's aware of grids in many different forms. Uh, this was a shot that I took at uh, St Pancras Station on the way down here. We just love, don't we, to kind of enforce uniformity on ourselves. Now, I'm not sure whether those particular gentlemen would, would appreciate being up there, but one of the interesting things I find when I look around is that we try to impose, as humans, we try to impose our will and our structure on certain things. And whether that's on buildings or on open spaces or on ourselves. And it's very interesting to see how that can mould and change when we start to understand what it is about ourselves that, that gives us this need. So running back into design, I think everybody here should be familiar with you know, a standard kind of grid layout. And what's interesting about this is that it feels right, it feels balanced, and the proportions are there that can you know, help us understand where things go in relation to other things. And on the web, particularly in, in the last year or so, there's been a kind of real resurgence of the grid-based design technique. Um, Mark site, obviously, um, Things like subtraction. This is Koi Vin, who works for the New York Times, I believe. Um, this is a, I think that language is Czech. I can't quite be so sure. Right the way up to, you know, one of my still favourite sites at the moment. Are you in here, Vila? She went, she really doesn't love me anymore. Which I think was one of the, you know, one of the most interesting site designs that I've seen um, you know, over recent months. And really it's the structure, despite all the different disparate elements that appear to be on the page, it is that grid structure which holds everything together. So the grids are fundamentally important. And we do things with grids all the time, even when we don't know that we're doing it. Now this is a, an interesting slide. I found this on Flickr. I was doing a Google, uh, a Flickr search um, for grid, and this came up. Is Guy Carberry in the room? I saw his badge earlier uh, on in the conference. I've taken this from your, from your Flickr slide, because it's interesting in the way that people are taking this, looking at grids, and wondering, ah, OK, what are these right proportions? Trying to analyse things and trying to say, yeah, if we're going to produce a layout, which is 760 pixels wide, this should be the columns, this should be the width of the gutters, etc. And it's interesting to, to, to see how different people analyse different things. But what tends to happen, in my view, is that we end up with that. And is that about as far as we can go? Is understanding the width of the, the proportions of, of, of the columns and main content and the sidebars, is, is that all we can do? So I was, began to think about this a little bit more, and I began to look at different avenues for laying things out. And I started off, I've done this electronically, but I started off by actually drawing um, a grid on the floor, actually, with some chalk in the backyard. And then just sort of laying stones and bits of paper, and, you know, trying to lay these things out in different and unusual combinations, all based on the grid but all wondering, oh, well, what happens if we do that? And experimenting with different things. And these are facsimiles of some of those results. And I began to wonder, why is it that we don't see pages that are laid out in this kind of way? What is it about our understanding or our, our thinking behind what it is that we're doing when we're designing that makes us fall into that more traditional pattern? Now, that's not to say that, obviously, we need to ignore completely everything that we've learned in terms of usability. You know, if somebody expects to find a search box 
up in the top right hand corner. We're not going to move it too far if we're talking about a site where you know, the main purpose of the site is to search. Um, we wouldn't be hiding checkout buttons in unusual places if we were designing a site where people were supposed to buy stuff. But I began to wonder what it was that was almost limiting our imagination in terms of what we can possibly do. Now, there are some very interesting constructs. When you start to work this way, there's some really interesting constructs that, that can occur, often by accident. And from a design point of view, one of the most creatively satisfying things is to start there with bits of paper and to kind of work things out. And if it doesn't work, you can screw it up and, and throw it behind you and carry on and do something different. And when we understand the fundamentals of this kind of design, we can start to do that because we can think, hmm, I know what makes a harmonious and a harmonious layout and something which people find people are comfortable with. But then we can start to challenge them a little bit. And I think there's been a, there's been a lot less challenging on the web in terms of design than perhaps there ought to be. And now when we think about CSS and the wonderful things that we can do about CSS, with CSS, and we start to understand that CSS itself introduces this new grid. You know, we have the box model and all of the factors that go into that, which give us a tremendous opportunity. Every element that sits on that page can be styled. It doesn't have to be a div. We can be styling paragraphs of content, even if they don't look like paragraphs. We can be styling all of these elements and laying them out in new and interesting ways. And they don't necessarily need to fit within the conventional grid layout in terms of just sitting side by side. These things can intersect, they can overlap. And in fact, we don't need to show the grid at all. It's just a case of having the grid there to give us the basis to then be able to take it one step further. And we can really come up with some you know, very interesting things that we can play with. And that's one of the most important things, I think, is, is, is the freedom and the flexibility to be able to do interesting designs. Now, I think one of the limitations that we've got to fight with is that HTML and CSS, really, were never designed for doing the kind of complicated um, and rich interface designs that we now need to do. Has there ever been a tool that has been specifically designed for making, for, for designing on the web? Does anybody know what, if, if there's a tool that was specifically designed for designing on the web? Flash. Absolutely. Flash is the only tool which has really been designed to work well on the web in terms of being able to not be constrained by you know, table layouts or the way that we think about CSS. And you know, I'm not saying for one moment that you know, we all ought to suddenly go back to using Flash and we should uh, you know, create interfaces that are frankly baffling. But we should be able to take some of the freedom that Flash designers have and be able to bring it back into our work. So um, unfortunately, my good friend Andy Budd didn't get the part for this. Perhaps they couldn't have made a muscle suit for you. But if we look at something like the Corpse Bride, which is one of my favorite flash sites of all time, you know, exquisite flash work that's not been limited by that design grid. And uh, of course, Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> so not being limited by the the limitations of uh, XHTML, CSS, table-based layouts, all the things that we kind of uh, run up against all the time, gives Flash designers a certain freedom that I don't think that we've maybe understood or seen a way, technically uh, or creatively, to be able to, uh, to bring into the work that we do when we're working with CSS. It also begs the question, of course, where do we go now um, for our inspiration? What is it that, wh where can we look for these inspirational sources that might just give us a few ideas and a few, a different perspective on what it is to, you know, 
bring in some of this more interesting stuff. A lot of people, I believe, start off by thinking about designing for the web by looking at the web. And I'm sure that there's you know, very few people in the audience that you know, haven't been familiar with the CSS gallery sites um, of one description or another. But really, you know, should we be looking at the web for our design inspiration? I don't know. I wonder sometimes whether that's actually harmful for the creative opportunities that we could allow ourselves. Which may lead us to this. This is a screenshot of um, a series of screenshots from CSS Reboot. Now, I'm not pointing a finger at um, any of the talented people that have put these sites together, but did anybody else feel that there was, uh, there was a, a lot of light text on dark background? You know, a lot of big chunky footers? How does that happen? Does it happen because Mike Rundle does it on Nine Rules? Does it happen because people look at Vila and think, oh, that's an... I haven't seen black, I haven't seen dark backgrounds and white text since you know, 1998. Might be about time it comes back. So I think it's helpful for us to look in different places. It doesn't necessarily need to be outside the building. All of these things are available inside. So we can take a little bit of a journey east. This is a German newspaper. Anybody ever seen an Iranian newspaper? I certainly hadn't before I started looking at this. All the way through and over to Japan, which you know, to me is, is kind of virtually incomprehensible. I find the layout difficult to deal with, but then I'm not Japanese, I don't read Japanese. Newspapers are interesting in the respect that you know, they, they have the same media. D they may differ in terms of their position in the market, um, and, the, and the type of people that read them, but fundamentally they use the same principles. Is there anything that we can take from that? Is there anything that we can look from this Japanese design and say, no, that's interesting. I wonder if I did my thing this way. You know, when the explorers went to the Orient, however many hundreds of years ago, and they brought back these artifacts, um, it spurned an enormous um, explosion of interest in you know, oriental design, um, both in terms of furniture, in terms of pottery, and all these things. And I wonder sometimes, and I've said this many times, whether or not we, you know, we forget to look in different places to see what other cultures are doing. Um, and you know, are we in danger of, of, of making our, our work you know, a kind of US, you know, global, um, global design style? I don't know. But if we look at this, we can say, OK, interesting. Let's have a look at the grid that goes behind it. Can I make use of this? If I look at the composition and I then think, right, I'm going to move that over here. I'm going to place some content in a certain place. I may not use this space, but I'm taking a different approach from perhaps the two to three column layouts that we've all been so familiar with in the past. And I do a lot of this. Is there anybody here that keeps a scrapbook? Yeah, not many, not enough. You've got to do this. If you're designing stuff, or even if you're coders, even if you're not actually dealing with visual design at all, it can be an incredibly um, interesting thing to do, just to find things, you know, whether it's old bus tickets or snippets from magazines, and set yourself little challenges. Because I look at some of these things and I think, that's interesting. Is that an order list? How can I make that? ordered list appear with that style on a web page. Look at this here. This is nothing more than a list of products. In fact, it's an ordered list of products, and the order comes from the order that it's referenced here, not necessarily in the pictures. Do we have to lay e-commerce sites out it, like Amazon? Is that the way to go? Is that all we've learned? We can take things like this. It doesn't have to be a slavish copy of you know, the design from a newspaper or from a magazine. But we should look at this and think, no, if that's an ordered list, how can I make that with CSS? And it's, it's, an, it's an interesting little job to do. Come on, remote. Work.
New batteries. Okay, I might have to do this manually. So taking something like that, which was a snippet from I don't know, the Mail on Sunday magazine, whichever my mother reads, and looking at the grid and moving things around and thinking, yeah, that can be an interesting interface. Yeah, grids are outside as well as in. I mean, this is, uh, this is a shot I took out of the sunroof of my car in Manchester of a, of a building that they're making down at Salford Quays. And obviously, you know, with architecture, grids are not only are they desirable, they're more or less essential um, for making buildings that stand upright. The interesting thing about this particular picture was why Doctor Who seems to have landed in quite an awkward spot. But we try to enforce that on nature as well. And when we're putting organic material into public spaces, we regiment it, we separate these um, trees. But there can be, when we look at architecture, some real interesting juxtapositions. I mean, the reflections between two identical buildings. Just taking a look up. I'm really guilty of this. I walk around London, I don't look up. You know, you're only interested in what's kind of, you know, three feet above your face. And this shop window, or restaurant window, or whatever window it was that I found, how can that possibly be relevant to what we're doing on the web in terms of design? Well, what we can do is we can take the underlying structure. Now, I don't know what goes here. I don't know what content is likely to appear in, in any particular place. But to me, playing around with these kind of things, using the full range of opportunities that we've now got, particularly with CSS, to be able to accomplish this kind of stuff, I think is going to make for a very different way that we view um, our job as designers. And in art as well. This is a, a spot painting by Damien Hurst. Well, if we take that one stage further, it's the same underlying kind of structure. It's the same concept. It's the same materials. It might not be the same wall, but the principles are exactly the same. But we get a completely different appearance. So it's all very well for me to say, you know, it, you should just go around and look at stuff and, and um, you know, bring it back into, into the web. But at some point, somebody's got to code it. You know, we've got to figure out how to actually make it work. And you know, it's got to be markup. It's got to be meaningful. And I think that's one of the interesting things that I've come to realize over, over recent months, is that we need to start really now focusing what I will term really meaningful markup rather than just valid markup. Because there's a really big difference. And Obviously, I would hope that everybody in the room has now got beyond the point where you know, you're choosing elements because of their presentational style and using them for meaning. But we still put a huge amount of presentational markup into our documents, even if we don't really realize it. One simple example. Nine times out of 10, when you see a web page that has this visual structure, the order of the HTML is exactly the same as it appears on screen. Sure, we can flip things around in terms of you know, left and right columns with floats. But we think about our markup presentationally. We think divs as in the same way, really, that we thought about table cells. So we have to move beyond that. So how do we do it? How can we see through the visual presentation um, and look at the underlying meaning of the stuff that's there? So let's take that. How would you mark that up, that picture? Any ideas? The answer is it depends. It depends on the meaning of the content and the information that you're trying to put forward. So let's argue that it's a list of runners, it's ordered because of their position in the race, and in the list is their number on the shirts, and maybe a link to their profile. Well, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? It's an ordered list. You, know, you might assume that you're going to mark it up as an image. I don't know. Should you mark it up as an ordered list? Possibly. <coughs> Think about a different set of meaning. So this is the ordered list. How would you mark up a line of taxis? Again, it depends. If we're trying to mark up the taxis maybe ordered by their position in the rank and the taxi number, 
Well, I think it's fairly straightforward that, once again, that would be an ordered list. But what happens if that's the information that we want to put over with the license plate and the driver name in there? Has anybody got any ideas? Pop, markup, quiz type malarkey? Definition list. It is a table, in my view. And I'm not markup God. He's next door. And when we start to move away from presentational um, HTML, we give real meaning to things like tables. One final example. How do you mark up San Francisco? <laughs> again, again, it depends. It really does depend on the meaning of the content. But let's argue we're just interested in streets and buildings. Well. Streets are ordered in San Francisco, first, second, third, fourth. They can't come up with imaginative names too much, apart from the ones that cross them. And that's far too complicated an example for me to understand. So what have we got? Each building's got an address. How can we mark that up? Well, we can do it. Maybe as a set of nested, unordered lists. And for those people that really wished by now that they'd gone into Tantec's presentation. <laughs> we can mark that up with some semantic class names as well. So what I hope that I've tried to put over so far is that I feel that it's about time we took stock of where we're at with, with web design. And there's been this whole buzz, hasn't there, about Web 2.0 recently, and this, this whole kind of feeling of resurgence um, and a new start in terms of taking maybe old technologies and making them new and mashups and APIs and, and all this kind of malarkey. And I wonder sometimes whether we've become actually a bit complacent even with that, because have we really reached the end? You know, is this a new start? Are we still thinking about the design of what we do in the old ways? Is the most innovative thing that we can come up with a fading yellow box when you put something into base camp? I don't think so, actually. So I want to talk about you know, maybe a way that we can actually break out and away from what we've been doing before, and a way that we can free ourselves from the limitations. Because there is a whole world of stuff that we can do out there with a fairly simple set of technologies that we've got at our disposal. So I want to pull up a term. This was actually um, a quotation um, from Triangle Tech Journal. Um, progressive enhancement presents a viable approach. I won't read the whole thing. This was actually written in uh, September 2003. And it was followed, in fact preceded, I should say, by a few months, by Mr. Shea talking about Mozilla, Opera, and Safari enhancement. Again in 2003. It's now halfway through 2006. Is progressive enhancement progressive three and a half? three years later. Why are we still thinking that this is the way to go for certain things? Why are we so afraid of moving forward? And I think it's because we are bound by the chains and the limitations that we talked about earlier. And we feel weighed down by the fact that I can't do that. It's not possible. My clients won't let me do it. I have to support X browser. And I think that it's about time that we woke up and realised that if we don't move forward, then we might as well not try. And I want to think about things in a, in a different way. And what I'd like to talk about, really, is a, a new term, which I've coined Transcendent CSS, which is really now a way that we can look to the future rather than looking back and say to ourselves, we're going to do this stuff. We're going to actually make it happen. And we're doing funky stuff with Ajax, sure. We're doing the same thing with CSS? Not really, because we think, I can't do this because it's not supported in Internet Explorer. So transcendent CSS makes full use of all of the techniques that we've got available, because we're going to need them. If we're going to take really meaningful markup and create these wonderful visual interfaces without filling our documents full of crap, we need this stuff. You know, we need the simple things that will make our lives easier. And we need to start using the tools that we've got. 
we need to start using 2.1 CSS fully. And we need to start using alpha transparent PNGs. We need to use attribute selectors and child selectors and adjacent sibling selectors and, and pseudo classes, first and last child. We should be doing this. But I hear from so many people, not in this room, but from so many people, well, that's great you saying that. You can do that on your blog. You can have the colored version for modern browsers and stick two fingers up to IE and give them the two-tone version. It's your site. You can do it. Well, yeah, I can do it, but so can everybody else. And they can do it. I'm not talking about sticking two fingers up at IE, but is Chris here? I'm <laughs> What we can do is we can start bringing this into what we do for our clients all the time. And it doesn't take much to make them understand. So it also includes not using hacks or filters. Thinking of a mature way that we can handle older browsers. And it means that we don't have to be constantly thinking about, well, it must be the same. It must look the same in IE5 as it looks in Safari. No, it doesn't. It's a mature approach to understanding and using all of the tools that we've got available. And it might, and I say might, include using parts of CSS3 drafts. Now, I'm not suggesting for a minute that you should hang your hat on the advanced layout module, um, because you'll be waiting a very long time but there are some things that we can do. And even if we can't use them commercially, we can be thinking about the column model, for example. Now, that's not to say that that's perfect. In fact, most of it sucks. But at least understanding it and using it where it's relevant in certain places. Or text shadow that's only supported by Safari. We can do it. We don't have to think, well, my users must, I must support you know, IE5. They must get the same look and feel. No, they don't. You know, when I get into a car, if I get into a Rolls Royce, I have a different experience than if I get into an old Vauxhall Nova. It's still the car that gets me from A to B, and it's still my ass that's sat in the seat. Do I expect the same experience? No. Do I box? And users need to be aware of that, and clients need to be aware and understand that you know, they, take, they need to take a mature approach to what they're commissioning in the same way that we need to take a mature approach in terms of what we're delivering. And you might say to yourself, well, it's all right, Clarkie, you know, you're, you're allowed to do it, you know. Your dominion over your kingdom, you can tell your guys that this is what they're going to do, and you can work with the people that you want to work with and, um, and stick two fingers up at people that you don't. And not that I ever do, but it's not true. We can do this. And I think we have to do it. Because if we don't do it, we're still going to be sat here at App Media 2007 thinking, well, it'd be really nice to use attribute selectors. You know, why is Dave Shea still talking about this or whatever? And we can't use it. We have to. And I'll tell you why. And I'll tell you how. It's thanks to a guy called Nate Coachley. I think, is Nate in the room here? I think he ran for his plane. He ran for his plane. Nate Coachley is, um, what is his actual job title, son? Yeah, yeah he's, a, he's, a, he's a standards evangelist at, at Yahoo. And what Nate did was to actually say, both internally and externally, and publish a statement which says that expecting two users using different browser software to have an identical experience fails to embrace or acknowledge the, he's a cleverer man than me, heterogeneous essence of the web. Now, if companies like Yahoo can do this, so can we. We don't have to wait any longer to be able to do the cool stuff. What it does it means that we have to think maturely and sensibly about what it is that we do for a living. And I hope that we do that anyway. You know, I would hope that you know, we would all be. Is there anybody in the room that doesn't have a, a browser matrix for um, a project or for their, uh, their own internal policy? where they say, when we're making a site with XHTML and CSS, we're going to go down this far. Does anybody not have one of those? Right, I'm impressed. I am very impressed. Because this is exactly the sort of thing that we need to be doing. 
And it's the sort of thing that we need to be doing in, a, in order to move forward. Now, a few of us that were lucky enough to go to um, Mix 06, which was the, the Microsoft conference in Vegas um, back in March after South by Southwest, Eric, Dave, Molly and I, we came in under certain criticism, I would say, um, for being Microsoft apologists. Um, you know, I even got accused of you know, being bought out, by, bought off by Microsoft, and I, and I published the list of free things that I've ever got from Microsoft, which includes two Internet Explorer 7 t-shirts, some stickers, um, several margaritas, and a copy of Windows XP. <laughs> Only so I can run it on my Mac. We're not Microsoft apologists, we have to say. Um, that if we, we're now at a stage where I believe that the things that I've talked about and this mature approach using transcendent CSS, using all of the techniques and the ability to understand them and put these things into commercial practice and be able to explain to people why things might work one way and might work another way um, in exactly the same way that now Yahoo are doing is down to one fact and one fact alone. And that's Internet Explorer 7. Because we do have an opportunity now to level the playing field. It's not perfect, no browser is. And I wouldn't expect that Microsoft stop there either, and I'll kick their asses if they do. But it gives us now an opportunity, because of the work that they've done, to be able to say, well, yeah, I can do that. And if it doesn't look the same in legacy browsers like IE6, well, then we'll design around that. Isn't that what we're supposed to do as designers, to work around and design around problems? Or solutions is what we should be coming up with. And that's one of the things I think we should do. So I hope that overall that's given you a little, uh, a little taste into my world and the fact that I've not been losing my marbles too much, I hope you don't think. Um, and with that, I've only just got one more thing to say, which is an absolutely blatant blatant plug. But as I'm here, and you're there, and you're not standing on your chairs, I would like to have the great pleasure of announcing that there will be a book. <laughs> and uh, with that, the presentation slides will be online tomorrow, and I'll blog the, the URL as well. But I'd like to say I'm really pleased to be here again, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Does anybody have anything that they'd like to ask or throw at me or issues to discuss? We've got some roaming mics going around, some orange ladies. I can't stand too close, they clash with my tie. <laughs> Gentlemen over there. Yeah, um, yeah. I was just thinking um, the stuff you were saying about um, progressive enhancement. Um, Sorry, about? Uh, progressive uh, enhancement, um, right. about the age of the technology, really. Um, HTML4, I think, now is about 10 years old. I can't remember when it came out, 96, 97. So do you think we're, we're also we're long overdue um, for a new version of HTML as well? Because it used to it evolved very rapidly. HTML2, HTML3, HTML4 came out. I heard the other day that um, the, the, there is within the W3C an XHTML2 working group. Yeah. I also heard the other day that there, there is either talk or it's been announced or decided, and I'm maybe breaking confidences, but it was pub talk, so I don't care, um, <laughs> is that there may well be um, a working group, and what they call evolutionary HTML working group, which is not the same working group as XHTML2, but that's as much as I know. Thanks, Andy. Um, All right. Hi. Hello. Oh, hello. Hi. Um, two things. Um, one is bulletproofness is a word we had this morning. And that means if you do your gorgeous, you know, clever, funky box thing, you've got to test it. And your testing matrix gets bigger and testing costs. So it's not just about 
testing across browsers and so on. If you multiply your browser matrix by your Dan Cedar home matrix, you get N by N by God knows what. What um, a scary thing, Dan Cedar home in the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an image I want to take home with me. <laughs> That's interesting. I mean, everything that Dan said, and unfortunately I couldn't be here for his presentation, but everything that Dan says and that he wrote about in that wonderful book still holds true. If, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're styling something and you're making a box, you need to take into account what users do. You know, do they increase their text size? Do they change the width of the, the monitor? Do they add the 14-foot wide AOL sidebar? Um, all of these things need to be taken into account. So, yeah, I, I agree that um, I firmly believe that testing is a very important part of everything that we do, but I wouldn't want it to get in the way. My, my point was it's just going to be costed in there, hasn't it? I mean, um, looking at some of your funky box designs back there, um, I think you said um, absolute positioning is the new black, because certainly some of those said absolute positioning. Uh, but then those boxes have got to grow, they've not got to explode, they've not got to overlap, they've not got to stink in terms of, use, of, of usability, and if you put your accessibility hat on, they've not got to crash and burn in that respect, and so on. I don't believe that to be the case, actually, in terms of accessibility. I think that it really depends. Going back to some of those, uh, those experiments of mine where I'd taken shapes and put them over grids, um, you know, we're so used to thinking columns, but if we put things that do that, um, obviously the content needs to be related. But you know, does that make it easier to use for people that use screen magnifiers? I don't know. Have these things been tested? Um, positioning, I think, is back because of the fragility, I think, of, of floated layouts, which have become the de facto standard now. Um, but interestingly, Eric pointed to um, Sean Inman's new Dark JavaScript solution for clearing positioned elements the other day. And that's something that I'm going to be using, even if it's only in perpetual beta. It seems like a really good solution for using something which is much more designed for layouts than floats were ever intended to be. Um, another question from over here this time. Anybody? anybody? Oh, yeah. Did you hear that? Um, slightly different type of question. I was wondering what you thought to. Um the increase in kind of like courses being run in university in terms of web design? Because it, the reason why I ask that question is because I think some of the uh, examples you put up in terms of like the CSS websites where you can go and have a look at what people are doing with their design and typical CSS type websites, it's perhaps because so many more people now think that they can design a website, and I'm not trying to knock these courses, by attending a web design course at university. And maybe what we're seeing is a bit of a lack of people doing traditional graphic design, illustration, fine art, and applying their creativity to the web. I honestly, and I've not stepped inside a college or university, apart from for, you know, using their conference facilities for, well, probably since last time England won the World Cup, which of course we're going to do again. Um, so I can't really comment, but I will tell you a story. Um, I've got a little boy, he's 14, Alex, and uh, they do IT at school. And uh, Molly said this story before, but I'll tell it anyway. And uh, he's at school and in the IT class, and they do databases and spreadsheets and all that kind of stuff. And the teacher said, right, we're gonna, this week we're going to build a web page. And Alex is like, top. Because uh, actually, a couple of weeks before, we'd, we'd actually built his blog. And he'd sat with me while we were doing it. He drew the pieces of, he drew stuff on paper. He designed it. And he argued with me when I said that he couldn't have something in a certain place. And we did it all with, a, you know, with movable type and XHTML, CSS. So he goes to school and the guy says, we're going to build a web page. And Alex is like, great. And uh, so he says, right, you go start, programs, Microsoft, front page. <laughs> Alex is like, what? So he does it because he's a polite kid. And the guy goes, right, so the next thing, you insert table. <laughs> Alex hands up. So, so why are we making websites with, with web, this web page with tables? And the teacher said, well, that's how all websites are made. They've got this like, invisible grid, and all the content goes in it. He says, no, no, I've got a website. It's not made like that at all. My dad helped me make it. 
Oh, yeah, he probably downloaded some program from the internet. He said, no, it's all valid XHTML CSS. <laughs> Your point is very valid. We have to start getting this stuff a lot further back in the process. And, you know, I talk to, I talk to people occasionally about this kind of stuff. And uh, a lot of the educational em emphasis is on applications and Flash and stuff like that. And I don't know where we go with that. It's, it, education isn't my thing. Of course. I just want to wait for the microphone. Um, as a university lecturer teaching web standards at bachelor's level. Hey! <laughs> I, I, I can tell everyone that Julie Howell at the RNIB is trying to uh, coordinate um, a lot of us to put together uh, a, a, a syllabus that can be adopted in all universities that thrusts web standards at our bachelor's students. That's great, that's fantastic. I've got time for, I think I've got time for one more question. One more question. Did you have a question, Molly, or? I did, actually, and, this is, and you've heard me say this before, but I don't think it's a relevant, a relevant question, which is, how do people, what do you suggest to people when they have to convince the stakeholders, the bosses, the people that are there? I, I absolutely feel that what you're saying is exactly what needs to be done, right? But how do you say to somebody who doesn't understand any of this um, to get the buy-in from the managers? If working commercially, I think it's important just to bring a lot of this stuff into the proposal process and maybe sometimes not say anything about it. These are the browsers that will be supported. But, but that's, an, an ad, that's an advertising or um, agency model. What about like when you're working within an organization like the BBC or Yahoo or something like that? I think when you're in an organization like the BBC, and I think a few people here from there, um, the idea of the browser matrix um, and the idea that you know, we're going to stop this far down is extremely important. And I'm not saying for a minute that we should just say to hell with bad browsers. Um, but what we should be doing is to look at our stats, look at what the sites that people are using, um, looking at the browsers that people are using, and catering for those people. Um, but not necessarily limiting the overall potential. But a lot of that has got to come from analysis of your own stats. And it isn't any good to go to website story and you know, look at the stats, the, the, the browser stats there, because they're not the browser, they're not the, the, the stats for your site. They might be the site for the stats for Google. And you know that's great if you're the webmaster for Google, but not if you're somebody else. <coughs> one more, I think. One more. No, anybody else? Gentleman over there. Yep. Can you touch on, uh, since you're talking about art, can you touch on gesture, uh, lines? You know, it's something not so grid like, but maybe more of the fine art. It's interesting, isn't it, when we talk about that kind of stuff? I mean, there's an amazing amount of stuff that we can do with, you know, with, with, with visual design. Um, you know, line work is really important. Um, I remember going to a college and, and, and hearing a tutorial going on where, the, where the, the tutor was saying, you know, you must sharpen your pencils. Because actually what's important in a lot of cases, particularly with drawing, is you know, it's the mark making that you do that can be so visual in, visually interesting. Um, I'm not so sure as to, you know, whether there's a short answer to that. I think, you know, it, it could involve several pints of lager in front of England beating Sweden. Um, <laughs> But I do agree that we, we, for certain cases, I mean, obviously it depends on what you're designing and who you're designing for and what the goals of that, of that particular job are. But yeah, it is nice to get more organic stuff coming into the design so that everything doesn't have to be, you know, gradients with, with, you know, with little grids across. So we've just got one more thing to do. Um, one more thing that I'd like to do. Um, somebody... Really, the, the person that uh, person that I've admired for a very long time and uh, was a judge on the Web Standards Awards and has had more name checks than anybody else today and has come the furthest distance. It has been independently audited by a panel of auditors. Cameron, I'd, li I'd like to give you my football.
So thank you very much.